Um, good morning and welcome to Grand Rounds. I'm sorry we're starting a little bit late. Uh, Dr. Cook is in competition with Dr. Cerner, so uh, I think people will start to come down. Oh, sorry. Uh, I hesitate to pull this one no, off because no, no. it took forever to clip it onto my neck. Again, let me start again. Welcome to Grand Rounds. I won't go to Dr. Cook and Dr. Cerner. Uh, you're hitchhiking or? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Dr. Cook's going to talk to us today about balance. Wendy. Thanks so much, Barry. Um, so Amanda Hill asked me to present some of the work I've been involved with in fall prevention over the last few years. And I thought it might help just so that you don't have to endure an hour of just that just to give you a bit of an update on how our understand of walking speed and brain control of it um, has an impact on important outcomes and how that's progressed. I have no conflicts to disclose other than to say I think much of my interest has really come from my clinical practice and my research interest in understanding and preventing falls in older adults and in vulnerable populations. And I think this is probably one of, the, one of the best areas of geriatric care where we have the potential to intervene and make a difference. And I think as is becoming a parent, it probably may have benefits mm -hmm. on other geriatric outcomes as well. And I've certainly had the privilege of working with some great innovators mm -hmm. in the Center for Hip Health and Mobility, um, just to call it to Karen Kahn and Teresa Lou Ambrose. And uh, I'll introduce them a little mm -hmm. more later. So, my goal for today was at least just to do a bit of an overview on gait assessment, something that might relate to your clinical practice, uh, to touch on some of the shared neural substrates for gait and cognition, and then just look at an exercise intervention that I was involved in, and maybe open for discussion just implications for other interventions as well. So these are the objectives that were circulated. We'll just start with looking at gait, cognitive function, processes, and then I'll summarize recent evidence. And I think probably just the motherhood epidemiology thing to put out there first, we know at least one in three older adults who are all over 65 will fall. Falls are the most common cause of accidental deaths in Canada. And at least as of two years ago from Kai Hai, it's become the third leading cause of death in Canada. So it's beat out stroke, but it's behind cancer and heart disease. About but over a third of adults over the age of 70, and certainly the majority of them by the time they get to be 85 will have clinically diagnosable gait abnormalities. So gait impairment turns out to be an important risk factor for falls and other related outcomes, and it's heavily emphasized in the fall prevention guidelines and informs what's usually been recommended is the multifactorial comprehensive geriatric assessment for falls. I think the other thing too is you could say the same is true for cognitive impairment, that we recognize that it also increases risk for falls and functional decline and disability. And I think until maybe more recent years, the thinking about causes of these problems have usually involved somewhat separate approaches. So in the fall prevention literature, it's been much harder to reduce falls in the hospital, in long-term care, which are populations which have a really high prevalence of cognitive impairment, whether it be delirium or dementia. And the American Geriatric Society guidelines from 2011, again, emphasize you know, risk assessment, looking for explanations mm -hmm. for problems in balance and weakness and gait, or you know, looking for and avoiding orthostatic hypotension. But there really hasn't been any huge emphasis on vascular risk factors that might contribute to it. Um, and yes, there's a nod to cognition, but not necessarily anything specific that we might do to help. So we've had a little bit of a disease-based separation of care. You know, their patients get referred to the Falls Clinic, or maybe they get referred to the Memory Clinic, but often these patients are having similar and shared problems. So maybe just to go back to some basics, walking really is a complex cognitive task. It's not as simple as we previously thought. It's one of our highest order functions. And even though it's one of our most hardwired repetitive movements, it's actually not as automatic as we might think. Because when we walk, we're out in an environment that we need to pay attention to, to react and recover from anything that's going to throw us off our feet. 
So I'm hoping that I can convince you that gait, and especially gait speed, is a potentially useful summary index of aging, and maybe even across the lifespan. So I'll just sort of go through a few ways that gait is assessed, and you're probably pretty familiar with this. You know, we've all learned in our healthcare practice how to observe our patients for abnormal gait patterns for a long time. But there are other things that our walking patient can tell us and show us. So one of the most practical ways to measure gait is someone's usual gait speed. And that usually ends up being expressed as meters per second. And you would just ask someone to walk at their usual comfortable space, uh, pace. And in my clinic, I'm just using the stopwatch on my phone and I'm timing them over a set distance. One of the common standards is four meters, but from certainly the Canadian Consortium guidelines, there's a recommendation that maybe even longer distances might give us better information because you want to capture enough, um, uh, enough gait cycles that they're kind of in usual steady state to get an idea. But the, the point is that you would give them a little bit of a run-in so that you're ca capturing their usual pace. So if you were to do one thing, I think this would be a really good place to start and has, I think, the highest yield and it takes less time than some of the other stuff I'm going to show you. Whoops, I think I've jumped a lot further ahead. Um, I'll actually show you this first. So this is a figure from Middleton and colleagues who kind of put, who put together some of the findings of multiple studies of uh, different populations of older adults looking at what a given gait speed might, gait speed might mean. Because um, if you measure it, you want to do something with it to use it to inform decision making or management. And I would encourage us that to think about gait speed really exists on a gradient of risk. And it's recognized that for every 0.1 meter per second, there actually can be an increase in risk, specifically in 10-year uh, mortality. So a 12% increase in risk for every 0.1 meter per second slower that your patient is walking at their usual pace. There aren't absolute cut points, but there certainly are some ranges to keep in mind. And I've just cut the line there at the 1.2. So you need to be able to walk at at least 1.2 or better in some situations just to cross a signalized intersection. So thinking about you know, the walking pace you need to get around in the community easily. Um, this is also the range of gait function that's been associated or re reflects healthy, successful aging. Then you go down to one, and if you're going to remember one thing, remember one, one meter per second. This is almost like the precipice for vulnerability um, to bad things happening, kind of the cutoff in normal, otherwise healthy, independent older adults where below this, we do start to recognize um, uh, changes in mortality risk. So above a meter per second, you're generally above, the, above your age group for mortality risk com that compared to age or sex alone. Uh, it does have implications as well for other outcomes when we're care planning. We know that there's increased 30-day mortality after cardi cardiac surgery um, if your gait speed is lower than one meter per second. It also predicts incident mobility limitation as well. So this is you know, difficulty walking, it's American, a quarter mile, or to be able to go upstairs. It also is associated with reduced chance of functional decline or ending up in hospital over the coming two years in hemodialysis patients. Going a little further, now we're on the slope. So this is how fast you need to walk to outpace the Grim Reaper. This is median gait, you know, gait speed associated with median life expectancy. Uh, again, another way to think about it. This gait speed also predicts survival after all types of aortic procedures. It was 0.74, but again, you just that range, you're on the slope. And certainly this will now predict over the next coming three years, the increased risk of having dependence in dressing and bathing, so ADL mobility, uh, ADL disability. This is also where we start to see an increase in falls risk as well. And in our clinic, it was 0.85 that correlated with elevated falls risk. Getting lower down, now we're starting to see increased mortality after other types of aortic procedures. We 
see increased mortality in hemodialysis patients. We see increased risk for indoor falls, and you start to see the, the spectrum of risk increasing and progressing as you get slower. And then, sorry, just to go back, it, it's kind of shocking, 0.4 meters per second has been associated with the threshold of someone in hospital is considered independent enough to be able to walk on their own and has a chance of being discharged. And when you compare some of these other measures and prognosis, it gives you an idea of how vulnerable our hospitalized patients really are. So one other way that has uh, certainly uh, it had a lot more interest and evaluation is to look at gait assessment as a mobility stress test. And that's through using dual pass gait. So just because walking isn't automatic and relies on central control, it's a way to probe our cognitive control using a dual task, so walking simultaneously while doing something else. And you know, some people have used motor tasks, like can you carry a glass of water? Uh, we've actually used it in our, our clinic as well, using head turns as a vestibular challenge, just to try and tease out you know, what's, what's causing this patient's balance difficulties that might inform what we do differently for, for rehab strategies. Most of the tasks, though, really to tap cognitive control are cognitive. So, there's a bit of a hierarchy. Counting serial ones, so counting down from 100 is one example to do that while you're walking at your usual pace. Counting, uh, naming animals while you're walking is another one. And then the hardest one is doing serial sevens um, while walking. And it gives us an idea at least of how our patients are using those shared brain resources. Um, because certainly, as we see with older adults, there are a whole bunch of other things that can impact on walking function that sometimes require increased attention. Uh, and the ability to use attention reserves and divide them appropriately is going to determine whether a person stays steady or not. One of the other things that we're able to measure as well is the idea of a dual task cost. So really, that's just looking at the difference at how fast you walk at your usual pace versus how fast you walk doing an extra task, and then um, convert that into a percent. And what we've learned is certainly in general for dual task gait, people with cognitive impairment can't do this so well. People with dementia certainly can't do it so well. It certainly is more difficult for people who have falls, frailty, disability, and it's also associated with increased mortality as well. And what we've learned too is it might even help us in how we're assessing people with mild cognitive impairment. As you might recall, this is kind of an in-between stage between normal, a normal cognitive function and dementia. And we know that over a five or six year period, probably about 60% of people will have eventually progressed. And we think about 15% per year, <clears throat> excuse me. But the people who have a dual task cost of greater than 20% are much more likely to progress and to to progress faster to dementia over the coming two years. So again, this could be a way to be able to help sort out who needs to be followed more closely. So I guess the other thing to think about too is there's a little bit of debate as to how to use it. It probably practically speaking, if someone is already walking with a pretty good gait speed, this might be something else we could use to probe. And then there are also more detailed, way, detailed ways of looking at gait. And these involve quantitative measures of the gait cycle. So this picture of a gait cycle essentially just shows the parameters that get measured. So a stride is essentially from one footfall until you have the same heel strike or footfall on the, on the same leg. And then a step is from one foot to another. And so we use an electronic walkway or more recently wearables like accelerometers or insoles to be able to measure this stuff. And it allows you to measure variability in those measures which with each step a person is taking. And uh, as we know from uh, looking at variability in other systems, in this case, having increased gait variability is a bad thing and is associated with increased falls risk, increased prevalence of executive dysfunction, increased prevalence of cognitive impairment as well. So this has been used at least in research settings to be able to understand control of gait and also to look at um, predicting adverse outcomes. Uh, and I already touched on this as far as 
what it, what it can portend. The next thing to think about is that I think there's some increasing recognition. It's certainly not perfect, but the idea that there are key cognitive functions for control of gait. And this figure comes from a systematic wrapping, sorry, a mapping review, not a wrapping review, uh, of links that have been established between different cognitive functions and gait from longitudinal studies. There are more cross-sectional studies looking at other relationships, but I figured I would just keep it a bit more simple. And you can see at least that in addition to global cognitive functioning uh, and memory, executive functions have a strong link with gait. And there's certainly been a recognized link between your ability to do a dual task and gait as well. And you probably see that in day-to-day -day life. I don't know how many of you have been like up and down the stairwells here at St. Paul's, and if you're behind someone who is texting on their way up or down the stairs, you probably notice that, you know, appropriately so, people are slowing down to not fall. So just even to define executive functions, they're a set of mental processes and cognitive skills that allow us to really regulate our action. Often it involves overcoming ingrained automatic responses in order to function independently and reach goals. And things that get tested as executive functions can be things like selective attention, resolving conflicts, shifting sets, or your working memory or processing speed. The way we probably most crudely look at it in our clinical practice is using the Montreal Cognitive Assessment and just looking at that first line where that, there's that small modified trail B task and drawing the clock. So we certainly recognize that there are key cognitive functions essential for gait control and these are associated with reduced gait speed. There seems to be perhaps a two-way street where if you've got reduced gait speed, you're also more likely to develop executive dysfunction, or if you already have executive dysfunction, you're more likely to develop uh, slower gait speed as well. Uh, and again, both are predicting falls. Here's another picture for you that looks now really at brain structures that have been involved in gait control, and this is really more surface, so looking at the volume of different parts of the brain. And I'll just draw your attention to the top left, like the, the brown colored one, which are the studies that have looked at structural associations with gait speed. The other, the other maps are looking at other um, gait parameters. So I think the important thing to see is that many regions where there's gray matter volume loss have been associated with gait measures. And this comes from a systematic review of brain imaging and gait characteristics. So more, the more darker intense the color, so you can see you know, in the frontal areas, also cerebellum, um, the more studies have found associations with gait speed impairment. So the take home is one, that there are a lot of areas involved. Uh, and the other piece there too is even just being able to see that these are some areas that we've also thought of as being implicated in the development of dementia as well. And just because there are so many areas, I think that also really draws our attention to the fact that the central control also involves ability for networks to connect and work efficiently. And really that depends on white matter. So for, for gait, white matter matters. And essentially anything that leads to white matter change is going to be associated with slower gait. So it's prevalent in people who fall. It's prevalent in cognitive impairment and dementia. It, it increased the risk of falls and cognitive decline as well. And there seems to be a dose response. The other thing too is that there's now with ability to use even more detailed MR techniques that I have no expertise in, uh, really it's, they're able to tell us now about how white matter networks are working. And I think the really interesting thing is this is even before white matter hyper intensities are showing up on imaging. The other thing to know about is that it's not just white matter hyperintensities, but while we may commonly see many of these changes in imaging in our patients, I think the, the take home message is that any, many types of co covert or what has previously been considered to be covert brain injury uh, are prevalent, but probably not benign as used to be thought. So this meta-analysis just shows how common it is in the wider population of older adults where over 80% of these 14,000 participants 
ended up have, having evidence of white matter hyperintensities and perivascular spaces. And a smaller proportion had covert brain infarcts and um, microbleeds. But all types of covert lesions taken together were associated with an increased risk for dementia, stroke, and death. This study didn't look at outcomes of falls. So hopefully, even just as a recap, we can remind ourselves that abnormal gait really does end up being a bit of an early warning sign for abnormal aging and for vulnerable brains. And it can work like a composite index of brain health, and it's something that's easier for us to observe, measure, and recognize. And maybe it can help in identifying people who we could be focusing preventative, preventative efforts toward. And I just wanted to share this study with you that came out just recently uh, along the lines of gait speed and aging not just being a geriatric thing. So this might actually work as a summary index of aging perhaps through a wider course of the lifespan and not just in the patients that I end up seeing. And just briefly, this is a study from New Zealand that took a 1972 birth cohort and did a whole bunch of studies over many years. They did neurocog batteries at the age of three and followed it up at age 45. They also measured a whole bunch of biomarkers associated with aging and ones you would consider for vascular risk, like blood pressure, BMI, A1C, leptin, um, and lipid levels, among others, and renal function. And then they measured usual gait speed, they measured fast gait speed and dual task as well and created an index. And I think the humbling thing was that having a gait index that was uh, slower was already associated with demonstrating higher rates of physiologic aging. So they used this index to figure out if people were aging faster than their years. And humbling, it was humbling to see this is a combination of fast gait speed. So these numbers look a lot faster than the ones that I just presented to you for usual gait speed. And I think the usual gait speed for this population at age 45 was uh, some, I think it was around 1.3. It was slower gait speed was also associated with lower childhood brain health, was associated with decline in cognition from childhood to mid-adulthood and adult IQ. It was also associated with brain changes. Not everybody had brain changes, but the, the degree and extent was, was also present as well. So I guess the humbling thing is some of these brain changes are happening early in life, and there is probably a lot of lead time, maybe an opportunity to intervene earlier than by the time they see a geriatrician. And then just recapping it. There are a whole bunch of things that can contribute, and I haven't specifically even talked to, um, relating to hypertension and vascular disease, but I think that's certainly one that's been recognized you know, with recent developments as being a significant and potentially modifiable risk factor for brain structure and function and other age-related changes as well as neurodegeneration and then whatever other preclinical life exposures happen. And I think the challenge is understanding when, where, and how to intervene because probably like myself, many of us are only seeing patients when they're experiencing the conditions down at the bottom. So exercise, now just sort of moving into interventions, exercise has certainly been central to fall prevention efforts in community dwelling older adults, and that's been shown as a standalone intervention or as part of multifactorial interventions where other things are being done to address falls risk like medication or vision. Um, and optimizing other health conditions. And so there has been an updated Cochrane review in January of this year, and it certainly confirms the benefit of exercise to prevent falls for people living in the community. It's been a little harder to show as ro uh, such robust effects for other populations. Uh, it hasn't really been clear about whether and what kind of exercise could prevent falls in high-risk older adults. And oh, tell you a bit of the story. This is really how the Action Seniors trial um, came about. One of the things that this really was back in 2004, there was it followed on a study done of some older adults who came to the emergency department at VGH and it was just over 50 of them.
these people were seen for a fall and then they were discharged and none of them received guideline care, um, which may not be such a shock, but the unfortunate thing was that their fall risk using um, uh, physical performance measure uh, profile got worse over six months by 30%. And there were also a high number of fractures, including hip fractures, so a really high fracture rate. So this was really the impetus for uh, developing uh, the Falls Clinic at the Center for Hip Health and Mobility and then also looking at developing this trial to see if an exercise intervention could help address this. So that was one of the questions is, you know, could, could an exercise intervention used in the community for all comers just by age be helpful? And then the other question was, we really don't know how exercise might reduce falls as well and whether there is a, a brain or a cognitive connection. So the action, I just want to again acknowledge Karm Khan was instrumental in setting up the clinic and as well just building the networks with the emergency department and family physicians. I think one of the things that has humbled me in this trial and another trial I've been involved in with older adults is it's really hard to recruit patients. And it's, it's been a challenge with this one and, and also the, the other one. And then Teresa Lou Ambrose has added her significant expertise in um, study of exercise and cognition as well. So the primary was to assess the efficacy of the Otago Home Exercise Program as a secondary fall prevention strategy. And I'll explain what that exercise is in a moment. And these. Uh, our patient population were over the age of 70 living in the community who presented to a healthcare provider because of a fall and then had been referred on to the falls clinic. So the Otago exercise program is probably one of the most well studied exercise programs. It was developed in New Zealand by John Campbell and Claire Robertson. They have studied it in older adults first delivered by a physiotherapist we were able to translate it to a nurse providing um, the care. They were able to show that it reduces uh, falls and injurious falls, and it actually saves money when used for people over the age of 80. Subsequent studies have actually shown that it actually reduces mortality, which is not an easy thing to show in older adults. And it's pretty low, low intensity. I mean, they start off with five minutes of stretching, they're doing leg extensions with an ankle weight. They're standing up and doing leg bends. And then balance, uh, balance training involves squats, heel to toe, you know, side steps. It's not, it's not super complicated, and it, it's not terribly intense. Uh, and maybe that's some of the appeal and the effect, that it may be because maybe it's doable. Um, and the expectation is that people will do this the, the strength and balance exercises three times a week and then walk at least two other days of the week. It's, uh, and it does involve some support with uh, visits by a physiotherapist over the first couple of months and then um, as well supportive check-ins. So just a little bit more about the study participants too. There was a little bit of uh, greater selection that these patients were not enrolled if they had dementia or any other neurodegenerative disease, stroke, or hip fracture. So they're not exactly like the, the, all the patients who come to see us in other healthcare settings. They also had to have evidence of a higher falls risk. So they had to have had at least two falls in the last year, or they had to have slow movement. So they're timed up and go, which is the one where you stand up from a chair, you walk three meters, turn around, come back and sit down. It had to take longer than 15 seconds. A normal tug should be less than 10. Um, or have a, a, a composite measure of falls risk to be one standard deviation above the age match. So for usual care, they were seen in the falls clinic by a geriatrician and received assessment, management, uh, recommendations based on the American Geriatric Society guidelines and for the exercise arm they received that plus the Otago exercise. We talked about the outcomes in order to prospectively follow falls 
you need to follow up on people pretty regularly because it's been well recognized that people will forget. So the standard is usually monthly fall calendars and then telephone follow-up. There were other secondary outcomes using some um, uh, neuropsych tests of executive functioning and the one I'm showing you here is the digit symbol substitution test. And it's been shown to be pretty responsive or I think pretty sensitive to deficits in general cognitive function, especially um, involving motor speed, where you have to copy and translate uh, the uh, numbers and symbols. There were other things that we looked at too, which are usual measurements of falls risk, lower extremity performance, um, and also gait speed. So this is the consort uh, flow diagram, ultimately just to say that we, there was pretty good follow-up and the adherence was so-so. I would say about two it was 63%, so less than two-thirds were fully adherent with the strength and balance. But everybody was walking more than recommended. And our patients, as you can see, were old, female, well-educated, and were current fallers, so they've been having three falls in the last 12 months. The other thing to highlight as well is that this group at least met the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Criteria uh, for mild cognitive impairment. And they weren't fast, not surprisingly, they were selected for that. So these are people who are already on the slope of risk. And this is what we found. This is a graph of the primary outcome of cumulative falls between the groups out to 12 months. So the usual care is orange and the exercise is the blue and the curves start to separate around six months. And while this is not a direct comparison, I just put the falls rate per person. It seems like uh, a reduction in reports compared to prior to study enrollment, but as a provider, it's still humbling that, you know, two falls per person per year is, is, is still falls. There was a significant 36% reduction in fall incidence with exercise, even with that level of adherence. Uh, and the absolute difference of 0.74 suggests that just over one person, 1.2 people, would need to receive the Otago exercise program for a year for one fall to be reduced. Uh, interestingly, though, we really didn't find any difference in the number of people who had falls over the study, we described people as being a faller or a non-faller, um, or the time to a first and second fall. As far as the secondary outcomes, it was kind of an interesting surprise to see that there really weren't that big a difference in the physical performance measures, but there was an improvement in the processing speed as measured by that digit symbol substitution test. Um, small, and it it contributed a, a small amount to mediating the benefit of exercise participation on fall prevention. Which, again, is kind of a puzzle. We had already published a pilot study of 74 patients, and that one was um, look, using a, the physical performance measures as the primary outcome, and it wasn't powered for falls, but we did find a reduction in falls and also an improvement in a different measure of executive function. Um, I think the, it certainly is a, a consistent effect that whatever, whatever this exercise participation is doing, it hasn't led to clearly demonstrated changes in physical performance, but it has been able to help reduce falls. Which then really brings me to implications at the very least, we know that a physiotherapist supervised home exercise program using this Otago program, it can reduce falls in high-risk older adults, and it's not clear yet whether it may be just small enough gains in enough areas from practicing strength, practicing balance, continuing at least as this population did with lots of walking and aerobic activity that we do know can be associated with improvements in uh, brain structure and function, maybe that may have helped reduce falls. Uh, maybe there was some benefit of exercise on the neural substrates. Uh, I think it's not entirely clear.
Right now, we're in the process of um, doing an economic analysis as well, and I think one of the next things to think about would be how well could something like the Otago exercise program be used to apply in community care, such as you know making referral to home physiotherapy for the Otago exercise program for people who are either you know seen and emerged with a fall, for example. So I'll wind up there, just saying I think general take-home messages would be we can and could continue to use GAIT to recognize at-risk older adults earlier in the course of life, you know, potential decline over the lifespan, and that it does seem to be a helpful summary index of brain health and aging. Uh, and as always, there's certainly the need to keep our patients moving, and we can see even older adults at high fall risk can benefit from exercise. I don't know if anyone has any questions or comments. Mark. Yeah. Thanks, Wendy. I had a question about that uh, graph that you had up where the two lines separated. Not all falls are the same. Some falls occur with a subdural hemorrhage. Some occur with just slipping off a bed. How did they quantify the falls, and were they significant falls? Uh, was any injuries documented that they found? There were injurious falls were tracked as well, and I believe that um, there wasn't a significant difference in injurious falls. The, the primary outcome was, was all falls of any type. Um, and then just for perspective, uh, I'm just thinking of another Study, it was called the Chaos Falls Clinic study done, I think, in Finland. This was actually in a primary care setting, which I'd humbly submit is probably, you know, likely to have a greater public health reach um, than relying on referral to geriatricians in a falls clinic. And they had a, in the range of 1,000 patients and were able to show a reduction in falls and a reduction in injurious falls. So doable, but definitely it wasn't on this scale. Can I maybe just ask uh, uh, if you have patients with uh, cardiopulmonary diseases, they're short of breath because of that and they can't walk fast, how does yes. it influence that test stuff you do and how does it influence uh, uh, the, uh, you know, did you, did you correct for that uh, confounder in your, in your analysis? I don't, um, I need to go back and remind myself. I think Certainly, the, the adjusted analysis certainly was for age and gender. Uh, it, it was pre-specified to be for geriatrician seen because earlier, the earlier work had suggested that that was uh, an influencing factor, but this group actually ended up being, the, the, the patients included in this study ended up uh, being 70% were seen by the same geriatrician. Um, and Comorbidity, I believe, was measured with the Charleston, so it wouldn't have been specific to cardiorespiratory complaints. You're absolutely right. I think there's certainly been, there's, there's definitely work done as well, just looking at the, the I guess you could say the energetic cost of gait, of, of walking being increased in older adults and specifically in, in populations that you would see, Stefan. Um, but it wasn't corrected for directly. How was the, uh, in the PGA study that you pointed out, how were the patients assigned to different groups? And then that's the first question. And the second, what was the dropout from each of the groups? So was that for the patients who came to the emergency department yes. and then after a fall? So that was an observational study, um, not a ran that was not a trial. Uh, so. Yes, so the, part, so when this clinic was started, part of it was to be able to build relationships with the emergency department to, to develop a referral pathway, which definitely took some time to build up momentum. And then also uh, that's where Karm Khan, I think, was really instrumental in, you know, kind of setting up the infrastructure for the clinic, reaching out to family physicians of patients who had been seen in the emergency department as well to say, would you endorse? referring your patients to this clinic. 
So that was how the population was accessed. Um, and then, so it was a usual referral as per usual clinical practice to the clinic. And then after the clinic assessment, the patient or the patients really were um, given information about the randomized trial and could choose to participate or not. So I, is that your question? Oh, no, 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 it was randomized and blinded. Um, oh, let me go back. To here, sorry, I need my left. So of 172 in each arm, there were 146 and 150 who completed. And so the people who refused and were lost were, were similar between groups. Was that your question? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's really fascinating, the, the slide with the different um, overall gait parameters and then the parts of the brain that were affected. I, I may have missed it. Was that neuroimaging or was that metabolism? It was neuroimaging. So, neuroimaging. so that one was structural neuroimaging. Yeah. And then there have been other work looking at networks, but I think so few studies are available right now and not everybody is measuring the same thing that it's not really clear. And has anyone exactly looked at subtle changes in motor processing, cerebellar testing? Can you already start to pick that up as well that may be sort of part and parcel of the overall gait speed or cadence or whatever? You mean to correlate it with findings on the physical exam? I haven't seen any studies that are doing that. I think most of the most of the studies being reported right now are looking at uh, MRI techniques, either structure and or function, if you will, uh, and gait parameters. Yeah, that's what we would want to know as clinicians. Yeah, the, um, but there certainly has been this uh, uh, concept of the. I think it's described as the motoric cognitive risk syndrome where people with early, early changes in gait are also likely to have early changes in brain function, probably most recognized as cognition, but it could be showing up in other ways too. Sorry, Barry. Well, in the New England Journal uh, this week or last week, there's a study published on uh, the finding of atrial fibrillation. Um, and you may have seen that the, the study. Mm -hmm. where people are aware, they had 49,000 people enrolled in eight months. Uh, took fairly large cohort, but you had some trouble uh, uh, recruiting. Definitely. Yeah, so this was a, a study sponsored by Apple uh, for those people that were wearing pits. Uh, the Apple Watch? The Apple Watch. So they had, they had the study, you needed the watch, and you needed some form of Apple app to record it. So I'm just thinking about your population. Yes. Maybe if you get Apple interested, it would be a, a core study, if you will, but uh, looking at, at uh, this as, as a way of looking at gait and, and different parameters. That's a really, really good point. And I think things are moving that way as well, just wanting to figure out different ways and could this be used as an accelerometer to at least detect movement and physical activity. I think that's where we're able to use the accelerometers. Um, for the gait measures, usually there has to be something in the shoe or kind of on the legs to be able to capture all that variability stuff. But yeah, so still so very cool. And then the other thing, there, there a different study, uh, nature, it doesn't matter, um, highlighted that there probably is almost the equivalent of the white coat gait syndrome. And this probably should not surprise any of us. It, it really, I think it's the Hawthorne effect. You know, even, even earlier this week in the clinic, you know, my patient was taking such a long time to walk down the hall from the waiting room to come in and, you know, and see me. And we've recognized that from the past, from London Olson stopped walking while talking, predicts falls, predicts mortality. But then I said, oh, yeah, Mr. Mr. Patient, I'm going to, I'm going to measure your walk, your usual walking pace now. You know, let's, let's, um, let's go back and start here. And then all of a sudden, I picked it up. And so, you know, somebody took it on themselves to, 
to actually compare what gets measured in the lab and what gets measured in usual daily walking pace wearing an accelerometer. So, get, uh, Barry, you're definitely on to something there, too. And then I just wanted to say, uh, like, I, I didn't even touch the, the whole area of vascular risk factors and the idea of, you know, shared common risk for these white matter hyperintensities and other brain abnormalities and, you know, maybe a, contributing to a, a more final common pathway. And your mention of atrial fibrillation, just even to highlight how, you know, earlier, earlier recognition and getting on to anticoagulation sooner has also had a better prognosis, uh, at least for dementia. I, I haven't come across gait parameters, but, you know, all those things that we're trying to do already for our patients are going to end up helping their mobility and and their risk of dementia as well. Any other comments or questions? Thanks very much. Oh, thanks very much. I'm trying to think. How many of my patients have Apple Watches? <laughs> yeah. Well, there needs to be more. Yep. No, I mean, it's 49,000 people in eight months. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I still think it's still very hard for engaging frail older adults or anyone with cognitive impairment. Like the other study I was alluding to was um, trying to get people after a hip fracture to come.